Okay, it's 531. So I am going to get us started. I'm Jennifer Shahadi. For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm the Women's Program Director at US Chess. And today I'm bringing in somebody I really wanted to bring in from the beginning of this program. She is an old friend and just a uh, an incredible chess coach, um, very famous for her teaching skills and for her accomplishments in chess coaching. She um, was the star of the award-winning documentary, Brooklyn Castle, which um, shows the journey of the chess team IS318 to numerous national championships, including winning the high school championship, even though they're just a junior high school championship team. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I see a lot of a few names I know. Um, some people I don't know, but I've seen your games. So I'm excited to, to put a face to it, to your name. Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see everyone. And again, I, I think I mentioned earlier that if you want to just like briefly show your camera and say hello, that would be lovely. Just so um, Elizabeth can see some of you and she might recognize some of you from national events. So today's topic, you know, I feel like we haven't had a lot of topics like this. Um, as I said earlier, Elizabeth is a very um, renowned chess coach. And actually, she's really well known for um, I, the level of this class, I think, is really um, suitable to your teachings, Elizabeth, um, as players in this class range in rating level quite a lot, but many of them, I think, are of that level that you're used to molding into even stronger players. So um, this should be really great. And yeah, I'll let you uh, share your screen and, and take it away because you have so much great content to share with us today. And by the way, guys, as usual, we'll have time for a little Q&A at the end. So you can uh, come up with some clever questions and Elizabeth will answer them at the end of the class. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I want to start, um, and I'm just gonna. Sorry, I have two monitors, so sometimes it might look like I'm not looking at you, but I am. Um, I want to start just by talking about um, the techniques we're gonna look at today, because I think the most important thing in any lesson is you come away with some concrete knowledge that you can use. Um, and so it's wonderful to control an open file and. Probably everybody already knows that. Um, but we're going to talk about three specific techniques that you can use to try to control open files. And then once you control open files, we'll talk about um, invading on the seventh rank, which is usually what you use it for. Um, so we're going to look at a bunch of examples today. Um, so I'd like you to take a look at this position. And in this position, we see that white's already developed a little bit faster. Right. Sometimes when people are playing the opening, it's easy to feel like, ah, maybe I'll play H3. Right. Maybe, maybe it'll, it won't matter too much, the tempo, right? And maybe it'll be useful. And very rarely do you see sort of the counter example of, you know what, it's not useful and it costs you something. But here, um, okay, nobody played H3, but we're going to see that white was a little bit quicker in development and already has her rook on the C file. So I'd like you to take a look at this position and you're choosing a move for white. Um, Sarah, do you want to explain what you played? So um, I suggested rook c2 mm -hmm. because you can play on the next move either queen c3 or rook, C1, rook fc1. And you always have enough space to move the other piece to the other square so okay. you can triple up sure and what if i play rook c8 here then i think we could do rook f c1 okay and then let's say i play h6 because i don't want to get back rank checkmated what about rook takes rook takes rook then rook takes rook then rook c3 ah okay so rook c3 is a very nice move here right getting ready maybe to put the queen behind the rook if they don't take right and then force them to take and give you the file and this is a fantastic idea it's so fantastic we can even do it a little bit faster earlier right so rook c2 is a good move but the best move here is rook c3 right because after rook c8 and rook fc1, like you were saying, when they play h6, 
or whatever they do. What can we do here that's useful? What can we do here to not just double on the file, but triple on the file? Queen C2. Fantastic. We can play Queen C2. And then they have to take... And we're, we're controlling the file. So super important to develop as fast as you can, but also to be thoughtful about how you're doubling on the file. Good job. Most of them got it right. So, yeah. All right. So technique number two is using an outpost. And when I first started thinking and learning about rook outposts, I was a little confused because usually when people talk about outposts, they're talking about knights. And when you have a knight outpost and you get your knight to an outpost, it's wonderful, right? You're done. You get to enjoy the beautiful knight in the center, controlling all the squares. But when you get a rook to an outpost, very often you're not done. And it's just part of your goal of doubling. So we're going to look at two examples. Um, I want you to take a look at white's position here and see which of the moves looks best to you. Ananya, did you want to, I know you were, were anxious to speak last time. Did you want to give your thoughts on this one as well? Yes, I would play um, rook c6 because um, because I was actually thinking of bishop h6 first, but then um, there is probably s6, and then um, if you play rook c6, I think there there is ideas like I it's gonna I think it's gonna change like to be the same. So I think rook c6, and then um, if rook takes c6, pawn takes c6, queen takes c6. And then bishop h6 was my idea. And then, and oh wait, sorry, um, not bishop h6. There's g, there's b5, which um, which forks both the pieces. Right. So we have this tactical trick that allows us to to play rook c6, right? And this is why it's such a great move. Of course, if they don't take, oh, sorry about that. Um, if they don't take us, then we're playing rook c1 and doubling and, and maybe tripling on the file next. Um, and, and who can tell me why b5 right away is not such a good move? Um, my idea was also rook c6. Oh, uh, yes. Do you, could you, do you know why b5 is a bad move? Can you see a good white, a black response to it? Um... Knight c5. Please. Exactly. Right? It gives black this beautiful outpost on c5. And it closes down the c file. So now you'll never really be able to use it, right? Yeah. So b5, a bit of a mistake. Um, bishop h6, as you said, looks scary, but can be easily met by f6. And, and of course, rook c6 using this trick to... Um, trick to control the file and using the outpost to control the file is the idea. Okay, here's our next position. And the guy playing white is David Bronstein, who was a super, um, super strong grandmaster. He was never world champion. Um, he lived in like the 50s and 60s. Um, he was never world champion because there were so many other good players at that time, but he was. So it's white to move. Um, Carissa, do you want to, let's see, is it a minute? I wanted to give people a minute. Yes, Carissa, do you want to um, say what you do? I would go to rook d6, and if the rook takes, and the pawn takes, and the queen takes, then you get a free rook. Right, because our queen's hitting a8, right? Another sort of tactical point that's supporting what we want to do positionally. And what if I try something like queen c8? Then you just push the pawn. Great, then we just play d7. Okay, so uh, on rook d6, um, black played rook e8. Sorry. Um, of course, white played rook d1. And then... After, uh, after eight, he just took the pawn on a6 and went on to win. But I really like this. I really like this move, rook d6, sort of showing, um, again, how how an outpost is doubling.
wait to move here and have a good think about this position. It's a very fundamental and sort of important one. Yeah, you guys are doing great with this lesson so far. All right, uh, one minute in. So let me call on somebody who I haven't called on yet. Um, Simone, is that from this one or the last one? Did you want to? Uh, no, it's for this one. I think it's Bishop A6 because although you you can put your rook on the file right now, um, Bishop A6 basically it just it kind of evokes any counterplay rook to C8. Yeah, and the difference between rook to C1 and bishop to a6 first is pretty big, right? In fact, it, its size is exactly trading one pair of rooks off. So if we play rook a c1 first, and then play bishop a6, they're going to trade, and they're going to put their rook on the seventh. And we're better, right? White's better, but it's not easy to make progress here. There's no simple conversion of like this kind of advantage to being up a pawn or something, right? Um, just because it's hard to invade. But if we play bishop a6 first and we keep both rooks on the board, then we have more sort of invading force. Um, and so let's say black plays king f8. Next, we're going to play rook a c8. And presumably they're going to stop us or try to stop us coming in on the seventh. And we're going to double our rooks. And let's say they go. Well, I think this is sort of an interesting position um, to talk about. If they were to play, oops, rook d6, right? And we'll look at a couple moves. We'll look at rook d6, we'll look at rook a d8. Um, we're gonna check them. And then we're gonna force them to give us their only rook on the seventh. Who sees how we can use our bishop to take over the seventh rank here? Um, we got a lot of great answers coming in from the chat. Elizabeth, Sujana, Sharia, and Tanishka all say bishop b5. Siri says bishop b5 or bishop b7. But yeah, we're getting lots of bishop b5s. Yeah, and the nice thing is that bishop b5, they kind of have to take you. And now some moves are terrible, right? King d6. Uh, King d6, and we just get. Well, this is a nice one. I haven't seen this very often. Yes, Violet, Pali Chai, Sharia, Sarah, Rowan, Rook d7, Maiden 1. Um, but even after something a bit more normal, right? Like, um, like King d8. Our dominant Rook on the seventh here is going to win for us. And what's the final tactic? Does anyone see the final tactic that takes advantage of, of having a rook on the seventh and having a bishop that's so much more active than mm -hmm. stuck on the other side of the board? Um, Gaia says uh, rook e8 check followed by bishop c6. A absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so let's go back for a minute to this position and also look at one more move for okay, AD8. I still want to use my bishop to try to, to, to get a rook on the seventh, right? So here we have a lot of space, but very cramped. We don't have bishop b5, but what do we have instead? Well done, Anaya. Well done, Sh Shariah and Marissa and Rainia, and Siri, and Carissa, and Violet, and Sanaya. <laughs> yes, good job, guys. Bishop C8, wow. And then again, we have check. And we're, we're, we're kind of trading, but we're, we're getting a pawn, right? We're getting something more concrete and more definite than an open file. We're actually keeping the seventh bank in the open file, which is super nice. All right, so super important technique in our quest to control the open file is controlling the endpoint of the file. And we want to do that um, when we're thinking of invading and we have two rocks, we often want to do it before we trade a pair of rocks. I think it's time for our next quiz question. All righty. Good job, everyone, so far. But no, I can see Sahana is excited to give her idea. So Sahana, what would you do? Um, I would play bishop d3 just because if you 
if you play bishop takes a7, um, you're shortcutting your development and it's um, you still have two more pieces to get de developed in this position. So it would be better if you um, got your bishop and rook out first. Okay, let's let's call on somebody else now. Let's see what another follow-up question there. Oh. What do you think Black would do if we took on a7? Um, Arania? Rania? I said knight d7 because they're attacking b2 and they're also threatening to go b6. So you'll end up losing your pawn back. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I like that move a lot. Knight d7, threatening bishop b2, threatening b6, trapping the the bishop. Super interesting. Um, Great. Does anyone else see another good move here? I didn't even see that. I so something I think is actually more obvious, Bernice. Rook a8. Rook a8, exactly, right? And you're just winning the pawn back and getting a rook on the seventh. And um, so I agree, rook, bishop takes a7 looks pretty misguided to me, unless someone sees something I'm not seeing. No, and I think that rook a8 is probably better because if knight d7, bishop b5 might be a pretty good move there because... You know, it's, it's stopping your knight from it's it's, it's multi purpose. It's attacking the knight and also stopping b six. All right, so um, Violet. Um, I chose g three so I can put the bishop on h six and then control c eight. Very nice, very nice. So so easy to make an, a routine developing move like bishop d three. Right, and, and probably Black would continue um, a knight d7 and knight c5, um, or maybe maybe d6 first. Um, but but g3 is a great move with, with exactly this idea of bishop h3 and then controlling the c file. Um, and well done if you if you if you got that because that was a really hard one. That's but really I, great. Seven of you voted for g3, so excellent job. After g3, Black played. Knight d7, bishop h3, rook c7. And now I can just take it and, oh, sorry. So they both throw in b3 and a6 so they don't lose a pawn because both sides are actually threatening to take the pawn here. But now white gets to the open file, right? And black has no real chance to fight for it. Um, the game goes on for a bit, a fair bit longer, and I'm not going to show you the rest because it has nothing to do with open files. Um, but um, I really like this g3 and bishop h3 and controlling the open file. Um, all right, we're going to do this one quickly as well. Um, I don't think there's a poll question, but you are black in this position. And I want you to think to yourself, how can you do exactly the same thing? How can you control a file by attacking the endpoint? If you see how, tell me in the chat. Fantastic, oh, I see so many good answers already. Fantastic, Lilia and Violet and Sun S Sujana and Gaia and Elizabeth and Rania and, wow, that's an awesome name, Polichai. And Simone and Marissa and Shreya and Liliana <laughs> and Carissa, fantastic. Yeah, black played here, bishop h6. Um, and then after rook c4, it gets a little more complicated than just controlling the, the c file. But knight e3, right? Beautiful control of the, um, the dark square there. And knight d5. Um, and now, why can't we play rook c1? Why can't white play rook c1 and challenge for the open file? Fantastic, Anaya and Palachai. Fantastic. Why can't the uh, knight go to g4 to check? Yes, it can. And that's why white can't even think about playing rook c1, right? Because of knight g4. Because even with it covered up, the bishop's still controlling the file. And so instead, black played. Oh, sorry. No. Queen f2. And 
the rest doesn't have too much to do with the open file, but right up one. The book invades on the open file. And then what's the last move that Black makes here that wins big part of material? Wins a lot of material. Well done, Gaia and Annika and Rainia and Polichai and Simone and Elizabeth. <laughs> and Amelia and Marissa and Dara. Yes, Bishop, Bishop G1 check. Good job, guys. Fantastic. So again, Bishop H6 controlling the endpoint. I'm going to skip that one. All right. Um, I think this, the, this is the last poll question. Yes, um, this is white to move, right? Yeah. yeah. What would you guys do here? In this one, we see white's already controlling the open file, right? Um, and white's controlling the open file because white has a lead in development, um, which is... All right, this one is, there's so many rich options here, so it's taking people a little longer. I like to see that though. Um, so we'll give you, we'll give you guys another 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then I'll call on somebody from the audience. Um, I think Tara, um, I haven't called on you yet and you've had your hand up for a while. So um, yeah, what, do you wanna talk about what you would do here? Um, yeah, sure. So I was thinking that here you could do knight d4 um, because you're threatening knight b5, which would kind of get the queen out of, which would kind of force the queen to move again. Might also, be, and like black isn't completely developed, their knights are not in very good positions. So you, I don't think you really, for black, I don't think you really want to be moving the, moving your same pieces again and again. Um, you'd also be targeting the a7 pawn. Fair enough. Um, definitely the knight, the knight's improved, right, on d4 and maybe looking at c6 as well at some, some scenarios. Um, anyone else have a different move there, there they liked? Let's see, other different moves. Um, let's see, Sh Sharia, did you wanna unmute yourself? So I wasn't really sure here, but um, I was thinking of something like queen e5 so that I could maybe trade off the queens and then, um, yeah, I didn't have a clear idea, but I chose queen e5 cause that looked really good for me. And then after the trade of queens, you can maybe bring your rook to c7. Yeah, very nice. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there were a few interesting choices here. Um, a lot of people chose knight c4, so I just want to speak about that briefly before talking about queen e5. Um, you know, you have to think a bit about the knight on a5 and if it's a good piece or not, right? But to me, it doesn't look like such a great piece, and I would be a bit worried that that this trade might be kind of okay for for black, like, um, yeah, I feel like the knight on a five was was a bit stuck out there. Um, so and bishop c four uh, again, I think the knight would take. But queen e five, just as you said, the point is we're just trading the queens off, and then there's no way because of black's lack of development that black can stop the rook invading on on c seven. So in the game, black played f six. And then rook c7, sorry. And then rook c7. So we're attacking the a pawn, but moves it. Now white improves the knight with knight d4, b5. White uses the rook on the seventh to sort of probe the weaknesses with, with rook a7. Um, you win the queen, you will you trade the queens, right? Um, and what move here wins a pawn for white? So there is a bishop on c8, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but let's see, we have bishop b5 recommended, knight b5 recommended, and 
Um, yeah, Rook A6. Yeah, I guess that was the one you're referring to. Yeah. So um, they, I want to take on B5, and we probably want to take with the knight, right? Just so we keep our bishop. Um, white takes with the knight, and of course, after takes back, we can take this knight. And then he takes again. And um, and black red lines here. Uh, but so important when you have the rook on the open file, super useful, but ultimately the aim is to invade on the seventh rank. Okay. Yeah, good job to those of you who got a uh, queen e5. Uh, tough, tough move. Yeah, so I don't think I did any um any polls about this. About was there a poll about Yusupov? I, feel like there wasn't. I don't think so. No, yeah. but that's fine. We can just have them ask. Pri we we can't people tell you privately in the chat, you know, so that there's or me. You can tell Elizabeth or me what you would play privately in the chat here. This one, who's this one to move? This is white to move. Okay. And this is not such a difficult question, but I really like this example mm -hmm. because um, I feel like it shows how really just having an open file is kind of almost big enough to win. So a lot of people are telling me work to D1 and then I'm also, I also got C5. Those are the two, those are the two suggestions that people are giving me. Yeah, um, C5, does anyone see any issues with C5? Anything you'd be worried about? Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I'd be a little worried about Rook C8 there. I mean, maybe you can do this, but good chance you're gonna lose that pawn, right? I don't know, I always I have to think a lot about that. Um, but okay, C5, I'm not sure what to think about it. Hmm. I think it's probably taking quite a risk, right? What do you think, Jen? You know, I think C5, Rook C8, C6 looks good to me because I, I'm I'm a little worried about B4, B5 and protecting that pawn. So, but, but my bigger concern, maybe after it takes on C5, Queen C5, oh, you're going to, I mean, I think I like this for white. I like this for white. Yeah, can I, I mean, can I move and then try to, not let you play b5 yeah maybe queen okay but i was thinking here i might have like a trick with rook d1 because you're back rank and you can't take on c6 because of rook d8 check but it is true that you could maybe play some tactic there like rook d1 rook take c6 instead i think that loses too sorry, though we were looking at, sorry, there's a lot of tactic there's a lot of tactics here because black's back rank is weak right so i could try rook d1 here yeah. and it looks like a good move but yeah, none of none, this isn't super clear, but I'm a little nervous for black. Uh, I don't think white's gonna lose this ever, but perhaps black could have just taken on C5 instead and figured out um, some kind of equality. Cause like, you have the C file, but we have the D file, right? Yeah. Like H6 and queen D2 or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd probably rather be white, but I'm not even sure because I, I don't know. I think this is very drawish. So, White doesn't immediately trade the pawns off and instead plays a move that most of you guys suggested, which is rook d1. And, and black plays queen e7. And now white plays a really natural, not even too hard to find move um, to control the d file. And that's great. It's queen d2 or queen d3. They're both really good, right? Um, he plays queen d2. Three, G six, and now, how do you decide between D six and D seven? Right, they both look really active, but White's thinking a lot about Black's counterplay. So after Queen D seven, um, he's a little worried about Queen A three. Right, which kind of is annoying because do I want to play rook d2? Like I'm defending the a pawn and attacking the a pawn. So to prevent that, white starts with queen d6, right? Blocking the diagonal. Um, and now after rook e8, 
now plays queen d7. And I think this is really clever, right? Provoked rook e8, and now we can't play queen a3 because it just hangs a rook. Hmm. Um, well, I've never seen the, seen this example. That's pretty cool. So yeah, king f8, that's what I was going to suggest, OK? OK. And now I'd like everyone to think and tell me in the chat what you would do as, as white here. Because black wants to just trade queens and play rook e7, right, and trade rooks and the drawn king and pawn and Um So tell me in the chat what you would do as white. Um, I like that move, uh, Shreya. Shariah, um, is there another move that's similar that's more, um, more annoying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, Rinia, you, you can tell that to Elizabeth as well. Oh, hi, Adia. Let me make you a co-host. Welcome. All right, so I'm seeing some great ideas here. Um, I think rook d6 probably doesn't do that, like doesn't change Black's plan. Black's still gonna trade and um, and exchange the rooks. Uh, and sorry, I didn't see you, idea in the... Sorry, maybe I'm not seeing everybody. Um, um, and instead, people, uh, white played the really nice move, queen a4. And I people suggested queen a4, they also suggested queen c6. I like queen a4 a little bit more just because it also sort of keeps an eye on the a7 pawn, right? Um, and so I can't play rook d8 because white will take and take on a7. So black plays a5. And what's white gonna do now? Well done, Violet. Yes, fantastic. So many people getting it. Too many for me to name, I'm afraid. Isn't this often your follow-up lesson on open files, the seventh rank? Yes, yes, that's the next okay. seventh rank. Perfect. Because um, they're so connected, right? Mm -hmm. um, right, because that's what you usually want when you get an open file to invade. Invite me back, we'll do the next one. <laughs> Um, so rook d7, black plays queen c5. And now white makes a really nice sort of judgment call. Um, so have another think about what you would do here. Well, actually, what I think I'd like to ask is, I'd like everyone to think of at least three candidate moves. Because I think that... Um, so I, I do want to say that your candidate moves should... There's no real reason to play h3 here, right? Um, to me, that's really kind of a filler, filler move and not something you should really seriously consider. King g2 looks, seems like a reasonable move. h4 seems better than, than h3 to me because it doesn't create a weakness. Um, a3 makes me a little anxious. You know, you're not really going to play b4, are you? Um, rook b7 and rook a7. I'm not sure why I want my rook on a7. Like, do you want it, want it there? Is it better there than d7? I think if we played rook a7, I think the follow-up move was queen d7 after that. And I can't respond to that with rook, with, I'm just skipping a move for black. I can't respond with, with rook there. Um, I think, well, I don't know, what if after that you play queen d8, queen f, um, queen f6, and sort of do a backwards maneuver to- Yeah, eight. well, I have a real problem here, right? Uh, I'm not sure I can stop you checkmating me. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty serious to me. Yeah, that's um, a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, they so... They take to G8 to stop that. But then they're going to take on F7, aren't they? But then you can go to H. Mm, Short-term solution, I think. 
<laughs> and then and then checkmate. Yeah, yeah, that's looking pretty bad. So uh, okay, so queen d seven is a pretty serious threat. Yes, I agree. Well, he did something that really surprised me when I saw it because it just looks like you're at getting a weakness. But why played this move, queen b five? Mm. Accepting double pawns where they have a pawn majority, which is a really unusual thing, but it's because the rook is so good and is so much better than Black's rook. Um, and, and White figured he's winning this pawn, right? For example, if, if rook e7 here, um, we're gonna go here. Oh, and then I have a4 and it's just sort of better for white. Um, we'll bring our king in and we're up a pawn. Um, in the game, he played rook c8. Oops. Rook c8, rook b7. A4 and takes. And of course, as you can imagine, the outside pass pawn ended up winning. Um, in fact, Black resigns here because Black has to trade rooks or, or allow easy promotion. So um, I really enjoyed this because the only real advantage White has here, maybe in, maybe the queen side pawn majority if that's an advantage, um, is this open file. But he uses it, like plays so nicely that he's controlling the open file and then carefully avoids Black's counterplay and gets a seventh rank, and then it's enough to win. And by the way, about the rook a7 or rook d7 move, um, rook b7, because uh, I think that's really interesting from Sarah with the queen d7 idea. Uh, I think that, like, actually, that's what comes to mind for me, too, first, because I love to checkmate. I'm a very attacking player, and it's very tempting. But the problem actually lies in the same I topic of this um, lesson. I'm not. I'm not sure. I caught what we were playing when we got mated. Um, but we, were we, were we, we weren't playing this when we got mated, right? No, I, I, I literally did did control alt zero just to see what the threat was. So oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. But after rook d eight, now we can't go queen d seven anymore, and this just looks like a really nice move by Black. And uh, I would probably prefer rook b seven because at least you're pressing. The B pawn, but um, yeah, this this gives Black a very good file now. Yeah, it's funny. Queen B five is a great move. You know, it reminds me of one of your other examples, the Queen E five. It's kind of like this slightly paradoxical queen trade because you have such a great. Um, it feels like you have a uh, almost like an attacking position as white, so you want to like you know keep queens on the board, particularly in the other position but it's it's not permanent enough so instead like the liquidation and um having the better rook is bet is more important there it and is this position is going to be our final one and i like to end with it because it really shows the just incredible power of the open file so you know magnus has this pawn he's been nursing on on g6 um and black plays rook e8 here to stop queen e7 Tell me in the chat if you see white played one move and black resigned. Tell me if you see the absolutely devastating dominant move that Carlson played here and, and uh, top of love is black. Hmm. If you play rook f1, I think I'm gonna take on g6. Yeah, this is where that corny expression comes from. When you see a good move, look for a better move, right? Like I feel like rook f1, they're thinking along the, on, along the right lines, but. That's, that's where you need to think about those candidate moves, right? The three candidate moves. Yeah, and I hope that when you look at the right move that it sort of um, waves back at you, right? Rook C1. Rook C1's an amazing move because there's no way to stop Rook C7 and invading on the seventh rank, right? I can't play Rook E7 because of the queen. Um, and after queen f4, like trying desperately to trade, we play queen h5 and it's forced me. But, and it's somehow easy to overlook if you're thinking about the g6 pawn, um, because it seems like it might be abandoning it. But of course it's not because the invasion on c7 is so incredibly strong. 
Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Last thing. Um, the most important thing anytime you have some kind of lesson is that you try very hard to think about a takeaway from it. Right? It's very easy to like look at a chess game and like it's very beautiful and very exciting and very interesting. And then you leave and like, what did you learn? Maybe you learned something about analysis or something about some idea. But from this, I want you to take away three very, very specific things. One is that um, developing quickly is, is the, the parent, like the mother of controlling an open file. Right? Being the first one to get your rooks, rooks connected and get them to the open file is super important. And then being thoughtful about um, doubling or tripling heavy pieces, as we saw in our first example. Um, you guys were amazing at using an outpost um, to, and not using it as we do with the knight just to be there, but using it specifically to double in some kind of tactical way. And then we talked about controlling the end point of a file um, to prevent your opponent being able to challenge you on it. And finally, we looked at the, the example of when you control an open file, trying to use it to invade on the seventh rank. Thank you so much for your um, attention and thoughtfulness and hard work. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to, to try to answer them. Yeah, that would be great. This was so instructive, Elizabeth. And I know that um, this group often has some really good questions, a lot of times about chess improvement, but, um, you know, since Elizabeth is a professional chess coach, an award-winning chess coach, won the Chess Educator of the Year a few years ago, um, and all the accomplishments I mentioned with IS318, she might have even more specific or slightly different advice than some of the champions we've brought in whose advice is, is uh, also fantastic, but it could be like more geared towards their own experience, whereas Elizabeth dealt with so many hundreds of students. Um, Sahana. Um, since you're a chess coach, um, what do you find that, um, like people are, um, um, people in the 1500 range, what do you find that they need the most work on? Oh, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And I think that it, it it's different for different people. Um, and that's a useless answer, but the useful bit of the answer is that it tends to be the same the same few things for each person. So that if you look at your games and you try, you ask yourself, why did I lose the game, right? And I'm not talking about listing all your mistakes. I'm talking about looking at actually why you lost, what caused you to lose, because some mistakes are easy to identify, but totally meaningless in the end, right? And some mistakes actually are why you lose the game. So look at the games you're losing and say to yourself like, both why am I losing it and also, did I get in the kind of position where I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was thinking well, right? And if you go through your games, I, I did this um, at one point when I was in a slump, I went through and I wrote down in the, the front of my note, front of my school book, like why I lost each game. And, and the reasons are the same. You know, um, I lost for a couple of reasons. I lost because Sometimes I would get positions out of the opening where I didn't know what the plan was, and then I would like flounder around and lose. Um, I had a blundering problem that I like seriously addressed. Um, but but people have specific problems, and people lose the same way over and over and over again. And so I think it's a really super useful thing to try to like take a fresh look at all your losses, play through the last twenty losses, and see what commonalities you can find. Are you always getting to some point in an attack and not like carrying it through? Are you always, or not always, but are you a quarter of the time, quarter of your losses, like just getting a crappy position out of the opening because they play d4 and you don't have a really good defense? Um, but I think, I think there's no one 1500 mistake. I think there's mistakes that are very, very specific to a person. Sarah W, what do you, what you, what, do you, what question do you have? What inspired you to play chess? What or who? What inspired me? You know, when I was growing up, I I wasn't very good at very much. Um, my sister was much better at most things than I was, and I wasn't very social, and I, I didn't feel. Um, 
very confident or very happy or like I fit in anywhere. And chess was kind of the first thing I was good at. And I was like, thank God I'm good at something. Um, and, and chess is a very friendly place. It's a very warm subculture. You know, the, the people I've known in chess, I've known all my life. Um, I really valued the social world of chess, but, but how did I get into it? I was just really happy to find a place I felt like I belonged. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have so many questions. Um, Sarah Ramson. My question is, what is your favorite technique to use in a game to like, what's the, what's a really good technique to use to put pressure on people so that most likely you win? Like, what's your favorite technique? I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm not sure. I think people have different styles and different kinds of positions they enjoy playing. And one thing I've really enjoyed is watching how much it's changed as I got older. Like I used to be a much more tactical player than I am now. Um, and now I, I lean a lot more on like stuff I know. <laughs> um, and it, but it's also interesting to meet people, I feel like, and look at their chess and see how it compares to their personality. So I'm, I'm gonna try and, I guess I'm evading your question a little bit because I don't have a good answer for it. For you, what's your favorite? I like playing like sort of strategic kinds of positions. I don't really have a technique, um, but I I love like Carol Cons and um, games where you can really think about one move for a long time, but you don't have to calculate too much. <laughs> <laughs> love it, honesty. Uh, we have we have a question from Joshini. Um, she she doesn't want to be unmuted, but she asks. When you feel like a failure in chess, what do you do? What motivates you to continue playing chess when you feel like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, chess is really hard. And um, you have to, okay, so going over a game, I find really therapeutic, right? In the same way that when you're in therapy, like psychological therapy in, in real life, like you sort of talk through your behavior and you get some distance from it and you sort of see how you thought about things and how you came to decisions. And, and it's, it's healing because it's not your fault. It's just, you can think about how you behaved. And it's the same with chess. Like when you play chess and someone beats you, it's awful and, and you can feel really down. But the way out of that is to look at it and be like, you know, I, I didn't lose this game. I lost this game because I did these things, not because like I'm bad at chess or I can't think, you know what I mean? So I, I found that very helpful. Um, not always with your opponent because, um, you know, men in chess are, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I found analyzing with women sometimes quite different than analyzing with men. Sometimes it's just like a, a, another competition when you analyze and they're just trying to prove that they saw everything. <laughs> um, all right, we got more questions though. Uh, let's see, um, Abigail, you've had your hand up for a little bit. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, how has working with the kids at IS318 shaped how you um, kind of see chess and maybe what's one lesson either in chess or real life that you've learned from them? You know, I think that being a teacher of, of something like chess where there's no curriculum and um, kids get, get very good at it very quickly. It is a very um, humbling experience. You know what I mean? Like chess, you're going to be wrong all the time because it's really hard. And as a teacher, you have to be kind of um, willing to be wrong as well. Like I, I, I really love teaching chess because kids get so good at it so quickly. And so I'm not always like the best player in the room. You know what I mean? Sometimes my kids, are, my students are better than me. And that's fun. And it's interesting to try to help people in an, in an ego-free way. Um, and for them to know that you're rooting for them and, and you're analyzing together rather than like trying to, as I was sort of saying, beginning to say in the last answer, like beat each other in analysis. Um, but I think like humility is something I've learned both from chess and from teaching that you have to, when you're up there, you have to be like, I'm wrong sometimes. <laughs> Great. Um, Ritha asks, what's your advice if you're underconfident in your moves? 
Um, yeah, how to, how to be more confident. So a few things. Number one, you have to give yourself good messages. So you have to stop the negative self-talk. And I, I get on a lot of my female students about this. You have to stop saying I'm stupid and I'm bad at chess. And like you can, those words can never, ever pass your lips. Do you know what I mean? You have to cut them out right now because when you hear things like that, because you tell yourself stuff like that, um, you start to believe it. There's a, I mean, one big thing is you just have to pick yourself on, uh, up and keep going. And, and that has to be something that you're conscious about doing. Like life is hard. You know what I mean? Like chess is hard too, but like there's all kinds of times in life that you'll feel like, I just want to lie down and not get up. And just like in chess, you'll, you'll lose five games in a row and you have to play another round and it sucks. But you force yourself to do it. And that's part of becoming like a strong person. Right. And I feel like that's like that's something that we can practice as chess players that most people can't practice until they have life crises. Right. But we can <laughs> go play a Saturday tournament and practice picking ourselves up after a devastating loss. Right. Um, Amazing. I love I love that answer. Yes. No more negative self-talk, even if it's not as extreme as the examples Elizabeth brought up, even just like I'm not really don't really know this type of position, but, you know, um, we do, we do hear that a lot. Well, even like, and I do this, I'll make a mistake. I'll be like, oh, I'm dumb. You're not allowed to say that. You have to cut that out. And it's not because I don't, you have to cut that out. Not, not for your own happiness, but for your own chest strength. Right. I don't care if it makes you sad or, or, you know, more confident or more pleased with your life, but it will actually hurt your chest if you don't have confidence. Like there are some things in life, like driving is a good example, where it pays to be a little bit unconfident because it makes you more careful. And being overconfident at driving will kill you. But most things, and chess is a big one of them, it pays to be stupidly overconfident. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, stupid. I read some study of like depressed people, and depressed people have a realistic ex idea of what they're capable of. Whereas happy people think they can do way more than they actually can. Um, but you should cultivate in yourself an overconfidence. And um, I think Galvin talks about this in Brooklyn Castle, a bit of a swagger. Like you have to fake some self-confidence and, and you have to like give yourself permission to do that. But um, yeah, stop the negative self-talk and, and carry yourself a bit like that. Even if you're faking it, like it's helpful. That's amazing. Yes, Bernice really loves your advice. Um, Sujana, what's up? Um, do you like on the board or in on the board or online chess more? To me, I like I grew up playing real chess, real chess, <laughs> um, over the board chess, and for a lot of my students, it's been really difficult to keep motivated in the last year or the last ten months because of the lack of, of real over the board chess. Like it's it's very, very convenient to have online lessons and very convenient to be able to play Blitz whenever you want, incredible. But there's something like kind of like so what about it for me? You know, if you can't go to a tournament and if you can't go to nationals, I don't know, it makes, it makes it's less exciting. I, I'm, I can't wait till this is all over and we can go back to real life. Yes, me neither. Although we are going to still keep this group. That was definitely a silver lining because especially for the girls, like they're from all over the country. And so mm -hmm. before this, it would have been harder for us to all connect via just live events. Definitely some advantages. Um, and let's see, we've got a question from uh, Renia. Is your hand up for a question? Oh, sorry. There's a little bit of background noise, but I just wanted to ask like, what inspired you to be a chess teacher and how did you like develop your teaching style? Um, thank you. Um, I had a lot of weird jobs out of college. Um, I wrote encyclopedia articles for a while. Um, and then I worked for a Jordanian princess um, just as her like personal assistant, which was pretty fun. And then I started working for chess in the schools just because I was at the Manhattan chess club playing chess and they had their offices there. And um, and how has it shaped my teaching style? Well, it's, it's interesting to teach a subject where there, you know, when I started, there was sort of no curriculum. <laughs> you could do whatever you want to do. Um, and it's been fun. Like at 318, I have kids and I, I teach them for three years and I can do whatever I want all day long. Um, 
And so I get to choose what I think is important and what I think is useful and what I think is worth spending time on. Um, so that's been really great. Um, I don't know, I think all teachers steal stuff. So I'm always stealing people's lessons. I feel like that wasn't a great answer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> no, that's good that you clarified that because at first I was like, oh, pencils and staplers. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, that was very useful. Um, how about Siri? I think you've had a question for quite a while. We have like room time for like two more questions and then we will thank Elizabeth. By the way, everybody loved the lesson. Sayali said it was her favorite of all our guests so far. Um, so awesome. Siri? What is your favorite chess book? Like what you like to um, read? What's your favorite chess book? Like it teaches you a lot of things. You know, there's an amazing book I'm obsessed with called Mastering Chess Strategy by Helston. Um, it, it's just got the most beautiful problems ever. Um, it's got this whole section of, of improving pieces. Um, but I, uh, yeah, that would be my favorite ever, Mastering Chess Strategy. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'll try to, if you guys um, forget that, I can put it in our chess.com group or something. Um, Madison, what, 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 what do you have to ask? Um, I wanted to ask, um, who do you think will win the Tata Steel Tournament? Um, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't follow top level chess at all. Um, and I, I, I used to, and I used to love it. And when I had kids, I just kind of stopped. Um, you know, it was, it was a combination of having kids and like American politics became so crazy. And I became a little bit of, I started just reading sort of that. Um, so I'm so embarrassed to say that I have no idea. You can always just, you can always just say Magnus, like how wrong can you go <laughs> if he's not in the tournament, you know, uh, Madison, who do you think is going to win? It sounds like you're following it. Um, I think probably either Magnus Carlson or a Fabiana because those are the highest rated players in the world. Hey, can't argue with Magnus and Fabi. Love it. All right. Well, you know, everyone, this has been such an amazing class. I hope, Elizabeth, you'll come back another time to give us another concept lesson um, as this was so useful. And I especially really like your thoughts on negative self-talk. So I'm going to definitely bring those up in future classes. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm going to just drop the link in for our next week's sign up as well as after a, a long, we had Alexandra Botez in our class a long time ago, but that was before a lot of you were part of this group. So she's going to be here next week. So that should be very exciting. And Andrea is going to be there as well. Um, that's going to be at seven o'clock. So a big difference in time from this one. Um, yeah. And uh, just again, uh, th let everybody, as you sign off, say uh, thank you and goodbye to um, our wonderful guest, Elizabeth Spiegel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.